now that we have discussed sensory and short term memory, we would now exclusively focus on long term memory. Long term memory basically refers to the fact that the information is stored for a very very long period of time. Remember the terminal duration for short term memory was 30 seconds. So, if you are able to store the information and retrieve it even after the lapse of uh, 30 seconds time that means, the information has now travelled to the long term storage. In terms of sensory memory and uh, short term memory, we did talk about the capacity, what would be the maximum capacity of this specific memory type. We said you know, 11 to 16 items in the case of uh, iconic memory. Similarly, we said that fine uh, you know, even if you try to uh, chunk the information at maximum of 40 uh, bits of information can be stored in short term storage. In terms of long term storage, there is you know, uh, nothing like the maximum possible limit of the long term storage. So, unlimited storage for uh, any period of time that is you know, the most vital thing about long term storage, long term memory. Now, long term memory uh, can be of uh, two types declarative memory and procedural memory and declarative memory can also be divided into semantic and episodic memory and further episodic memory can be specified as specific memory and autobiographical memory. Based on the discussion that we had till now and if you add a little more to what you saw right now. We primarily divide memory into sensory register, short term storage and long term storage. Sensory memory we talked about uh, no iconic and echoic memory and we did refer to haptic memory uh, saying that you know uh, it is mostly iconic and echoic memory that has been researched well and therefore, we talked about it at length. Within short term memory we also had a discussion about the working memory. Now, long term memory you can divide it into declarative and procedural memory, uh, this we will come to it little later. The other when you look at memory in terms of semantic memory, episodic memory and autobiographical memory. Further episodic memory can be divided into prospective and retrospective memory. What we would do right now is that we will start with episodic memory and then we will uh, know move towards different different other types of long term memory that we are looking at in the chart right now. Canadian psychologist Telving was the first to make uh, the distinction between episodic memory and semantic memory. Now, if you look at uh, the way information is stored and the way the information is recollected you will find very interesting thing about human beings. We have very good memory for language we have very good memory for music, we also have very good memory for voice. Okay. Now, memory of language would primarily mean the storage of uh, the meaning rather than the sound. In terms of music, information pertaining to contours and pitch interval both are uh, found to be retained in our long term storage. And of course, in terms of voice, a reasonably good voice recognition is uh, no possible for us when we come across familiar people, but for strangers we do not have such good voice uh, memory. Say for instance, if uh, you hear the calling sound of your parents, if you uh, hear the calling sound of one of your siblings, okay, you would uh, very easily find out recognize just on the basis of the voice that this is the calling sound of my father or my mother or my brother or my sister okay because we have a very good uh, no memory for the voice of familiar people listen to this very music look at the clip to see an actual attempt by a child to memorize a poem Stamp your feet, 
the video that you saw right now uh, presented you know a mother uh, making her child learn to uh, sing a nursery rhyme. Now child was basically picking up the contours okay, and he was trying to copy the melody even though the exact word was not known to him and this was of course a, you know, uh, meaningful for the mother, but of, uh, it had no meaning for the child except for he was enjoying the music, the rhythm that he was trying to imitate. Now, after the lapse of this episode, when the child was grown and the mother was asked to narrate uh, some of the significant moments that she remembers about her own child, okay, she could exactly remember the words that this uh, child used to use. She especially had a recollection about uh, this very episode, wherein she said you know that uh, how the child uh, used to sing and what type of words he used to use and how uh, you know he used to repeat, imitate uh, the rhyme. Okay. So, this is a fantastic uh, you know, thing about the human memory system that we have uh, you know, very good recollection of the voices, the music, the language and depending on the personal significance of these issues. Okay. Our uh, memory becomes very, 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 very uh, uh, no good for these episodes. Now, episodic memory represents experiences and it is basically a memory of events, but these events are uh, recollected in a serial form. It is just like a television uh, serial which is broken into several episodes. So, we have the record of our past experience. Okay. And all these daily experiences of the past, they are broken into episodes. Therefore, it is called as episodic memory. So, when you recollect, you say, you, I still remember you know, my first day in school. I still remember when I delivered uh, you know, the first lecture on camera. Okay. These are episodic memory. Episodic memory basically also is the factual information that is acquired at a specific time. So, remember time plays uh, an important role here, it becomes an anchor here. Therefore, episodic memory is more susceptible to forgetting as compared to semantic memory, because in the case of semantic memory, it is the meaningfulness uh, that is given at most importance, whereas in the case of episodic memory, it is the fact at a specific time that is given importance. Okay. Therefore, even in terms of recollection, we do commit certain errors. Right now, we will see one of those examples. If one is asked to uh, recollect and reproduce facts related to a particular uh, event that had happened at a specific time period, we do uh, go ahead with distorting it. So, part of it is recollection, but we realize that whole lot of distortion does take place in recollection of episodic memory. One form of uh, episodic memory is called eyewitness memory. It is called eyewitness because it has forensic importance. Okay. You must have heard this word know that there is somebody who acts as a witness in the court of law. So, you provide an evidence, okay. you endorse of the happening of something. Okay. Therefore, it is called uh, know that you are testifying it, you are becoming a witness to it. So, when recollection of the information, okay, which is basically an episode at a specific time period, if it serves the forensic purpose, then it is called eyewitness memory. And of course, because it is one of the forms of episodic memory, so it is also vulnerable to distortion. Usually, the verbal report of the event might even interfere with the visual recall of the event. So, what you visually recall when you replay the event, the sequence and when you verbally translate it to report it, there could be little bit of an interference effect there itself. Look at this very image on your screen. Imagine you are uh, standing at one of the locations on the road and you see collision between two cars. Okay. Usually, if two cars are moving at a very high speed, the overall time that the entire process of collision will take place would be fraction of seconds. 
not even uh, one second would be complete when this car will actually come and hit each other and whatever had to happen would happen. Now, imagine yourself that you are standing at a specific location from where you saw uh, this accident. Okay. So, now focus yourself on the screen right now, see what actually gets distorted. Okay. Now, after the lapse of a certain period of time, you are asked to recollect what you actually saw. Now, you see when you construct, when you mentally know replay the story, what you saw was this, okay. but when you mentally replay it, you add certain flavor to it. Okay. Now, all these arrows show, no, these are the additions that you have made okay, uh, so as to suit the recollection, no, make it much more accurate. But while trying your best to make the story far more accurate, actually what you have done is that you have distorted it. Okay. This is an interesting aspect of eyewitness memory. November 26, 2008 uh, would always be remembered in the history of India because of what is called as Mumbai attack or 26-11, when Hotel Taj, one of the uh, sites in Bombay became the target of terrorist attack. November 26, Now that this episode took place in Hotel Taj, let us uh, know, look at this event from two viewpoints. An NSG commando who participated in this event, okay, in the anti-terrorist movement uh, operation that was uh, held in Hotel Taj, how he recollects the information. And somebody who was uh, you know, part of it and got a chance to come out of the hotel, how he recollects the information. Okay. This is pure demonstration of episodic memory. That specific time when you were in Hotel Taj performing the commando operation, okay, what happened to you? Listen to this. 29 year old Sunil Kumar Yadav, an NSG commando, belongs to Patadi in Haryana. और मेरे को पीछे से ना ब्रश्ट लगा दो तो बटक में लग गया था और बीपी जैकेट के ऊपर से क्रॉस हो गए वो मिस्टर अमित द मैनेजर ऑफ शामियाना रेस्टोरेंट इन होटल ताज आल्सो वाज अ विटनेस ऑफ दिस एपिसोड ओके हिज एपिसोडिक रिकॉलेक्शन वैरीज फ्रॉम द रिकॉलेक्शन ऑफ द कमांडो होम यू हर्ड राइट नाउ बिकॉज़ ऑल्दो टाइम वाज द सेम the episode that was taking place for Amit was different from what uh, took place for the commando. Listen to what Amit had to say later on. The moment he turns to the Shami and I started firing and I realized that you know he is not going to spare anybody now I have to do something and he threw a hand grenade and it blasted in the middle of the restaurant. The people on the other side of the restaurant, they managed to escape from the uh, service entrance. But I had around 30 people, 23 guests, 7 staff on the other side of the restaurant where there is no other way. Somewhere I recollected that there is a door at the pool side which opens into the transformer room of the hotel. And from there it goes out. So I, I asked the guests to evacuate fast as possible. At that point of time, I noticed that there was a foreigner, a huge foreigner, a six feet, six inch tall guy. He was shot in his arm and was bleeding very badly. And there was a couple who was crying. They told me like, my 10 year old son has gone to toilet just three minutes or two minutes before this thing started. I want to get my son. And I was very scared and I, I had a concern. So I said, ma'am, don't worry, I'll get your son. Because one reason is I never wanted her to go out, probably there is every possibility she dying. 
And secondly, she disclosing the location where the 30 people are hiding. So I went outside, there's a corridor, I was at one end and the terrace was on the other end. So he started, he looked at me, he started shooting. So I screamed and I tried to move away from there. He threw a hand grenade on me. I still have those noise, that noise, you know. It bounced right behind me, just three feet distance. I jumped, screamed and I jumped. And I knew that point of time I'm going to be dead. But my luck was so strong, that hand grenade never blasted. I came back, I told the couple that your son is going to be fine, trust me. Meanwhile, this person started bleeding very heavily. My boss came, he opened the door, we came out of a transformer room. Immediately a cop's van was stopped. Uh, we took the guest to bomb the hospital. Yeah, you know, whatever my life, the Wednesday on was 26 onwards, is all grace life. I always take it as I was dead on 26. Besides Hotel Taj, CST station in Bombay also uh, was one of the sites where uh, the terrorists uh, had attacked and killed lot many innocent people. Sebastian D'Souza, the photojournalist was available at that time. He was present there. He clicked numerous photographs and it was through the lens of uh, Sebastian D'Souza that next morning a uh, whole lot of Indians, uh, they realized what actually happened at CST station. Now, when Sebastian D'Souza was taken back to uh, CST station and was asked to recollect the episode that took place that evening, this is what he had to say. News photographer Sebastian D'Souza, the photo editor of Mumbai Mirror, takes us through that journey. What really happened and how did you take those pictures that day? Yeah, it was uh, somewhere around 9.30, we heard some loud explosions. The whole terminus was, you know, empty, but only, uh, there was loud sounds of, you know, gunfire and uh, granite blast, uh, blast. And when I looked towards the exit of the, of the local uh, train terminus, it was the terrorist <laughs> I saw, when I peeked out, I saw two guys in backpack. And uh, they didn't look like terrorists. The young guys, uh, as if they were going out on a trip or something. But no sooner the constable fired, he fired he, from the street or three from here, okay, they returned fire. What the two terrorists did was one went on the other side, one came from here. So I went into the next train. As he came out, I took my pictures. I got my pictures, I again hit myself. Both of them met, he spoke something, I don't know what. One of them dropped the bag. I tried to get a glimpse of them. These guys had turned around and were heading to the rear of the train. So I said, this is not good for me. I got out of the train, came back to this spot, where they had done all the shooting, destruction. I saw all the policemen who were with me dead. I was very cautious because if I had done something hastily like what they did, I would have died. Perhaps you didn't get a chance to really see them because no, you were... No, no, no. I just kept shooting. I just, there were many out shaken, you know. That means there was a slight fright in me too because of the gunshots and all that. And more, uh, most of the time I, to, I was trying to avoid they seeing me. Very quick glimpses I got of them. That's why I proceed, uh, kept trailing them. For more pictures, for more pictures. We are taking lot many examples because we want to understand uh, how episodic memory uh, no works. Remember one thing, we have discussed that it is time specific. Two, we have discussed that it is event specific. So, event anchored to a given time okay, and then you store it because of the significance that you attribute to it. These are all rare examples. No? the example of terrorist attack that we took, all of them were rare. One such rare experience, I will also like to show it to you. On 22nd May 2010 at 6.30 in the morning, Air India Express flight 812 from Dubai to Mangalore met an accident at Mangalore International Airport. Only eight passengers survived, two of them later on recollected their experience. Look at this. दुबई से वन आये वन फिफ्टीन में और इधर उतरे सिक्स ट्वेंटी में सिक्स ट्वेंटी में हाँ क्या हुआ हमारे लिए वो रनवे में उतरे का उतने के टाइम में ने गिर गया हाँ तो इतने 
शेखो के सीधे ब्रेक मारा का पहले मारने के बाद में बिल्डिंग फटाफट मार दिया मार दिया और टीम में फायर हो गया पूरा फट गया नीचे कैसे गया उतना दूर जाके कैसे गिरा बाद में निकल ब्रेक मारना है ना इसके मारने का टाइम नीचे गिर गया बिल्डिंग के पास मारा है देखा हम सही तुम अकेले थे हम पास में हमारे हम अकेले तुम्हारे साथ कितने आदमी और बाहर आ गए बाकी हम चार पांच आदमी हम देखा हम लोग आने के टाइम में ना नीचे उतारने के टाइम नीचे उतारा थोड़ा लाइक फिर एक शेर से गया शेर से इधर भी जाके मारा लाइक वो टाइम आग आ गया हम लोग नीचे गिर गया फिर थोड़ा ऊपर थोड़ा जगह हम लोग देखा उधर से हम लोग भाग गया बाहर फिर थोड़ा जंगल था शेर में उधर से बाहर आया तो उधर एक रेलवे ट्रैक था उधर तक हम लोग आया कैसे उधर से आदमी लोग हम लोग इलाके इधर रहा पांच आदमी था now what you actually saw here was uh, you know amazing the way the two uh, passengers who had a very narrow escape who defeated death could you no know, actually recollect the tilt of the flight uh, you know the jerk that they felt when the flight you know did hit the ground and what actually happened they were sitting inside the flight and they visualize you no know, they recreate the whole sequence of events what actually would have happened there okay these are you no know, examples of episodic memory and of course you uh, know these were all uh, examples we all know because they were historic events uh, from the history point of view but you recollect your own life experience and you would realize that you have thousands and thousands of such episodic recollections because you provide certain specific significance to it therefore the whole lot of factors they affect episodic memory first one of course is the significance of the event besides that amount and space of practice how much amount of practice has actually gone into uh, you know storing this very information okay if you have practiced something more and more okay the chances are uh, that you would recollect it better if there are you no know, competing events temporally two significant events take place at the same time what is the temporal gap between the first and the second event that would also play a role if both are equally significant and temporally there is not much of a difference there could be an interference if there is a distribution pattern one event took place at this time the other event took place little later then you get time and space okay to practice this information and uh, no reserve it in the episodic memory second very important thing is the type of processing okay you heard mr amit right now when he said towards the end of his interview that the life after 2611 is a grace period for him this is how he interprets so how do you process the experience that is important okay the way you process will decide how much of uh, no uh how much of recollection you will have and the level of accuracy with which you will be able to recollect the information three and more uh, important is also the fact that how do you uh, know queue the information that you are storing it is equivalent to something like you know giving a file name when you save a file in your pc okay uh, say for example you no know, if i uh, have an event okay uh, say for example uh, today's date i give it as a file name and i know that my search will always be uh, you no know, using the date so if i have to find out what happened at this point in time i just search for uh, the file name that has to do with this date there could be a situation if i uh, you know give file name uh, not by date but by event okay so if i have a seminar whether i have a class whether i am going for uh, some other invited talk i you know give different file names okay uh, similarly say uh, i'm sure when you store uh, photographs on your pc you create a folder and you give name to the folder so say for example if you have gone to uh, say any uh, tourist place say you went to agra you make a folder named agra you came to kanpur and you give a folder name kanpur okay photographs of agra are stored in uh, the folder agra photographs of kanpur are stored in 
the folder named Kanpur and this is a relevant cue that you are giving to yourself because next time if you have to look at the photographs that you uh, know clicked in Agra you will go for you know the folder which has the name Agra. So, all episodes okay, whether it is uh, you know the code that you give is the time and you say I remember when I was at CST station in the evening at this time waiting for this very train okay, which has the departure time at this uh, uh, say 6 o'clock okay, and 5.58 was the time when this accident took place, when this episode took place. Okay. So, this works as a retrieval queue, better and more efficient the retrieval queue far more uh, you know, better it would be and convenient it would be for you to recollect the event. Also the information the recollection will be very very accurate because retrieval queue is correct. Of course, we have been talking about significance. So, episodic memory is bound to be context dependent okay. in which context did this happen. Okay. So, when you recollect the information in what context are you trying to recollect the information. So, if there is a match in the context in which it was stored and in which you are trying to retrieve more and more is the match between the context higher is the probability that you would recollect it better. And of course, besides context it is also the state which plays a role. Okay. So, retrieval of episodic memory is also state dependent. In what mood state you were okay, when you experience this. So, you were at a given point in time on the station when the when the terrorist attack took place and when you recollect the experience it is also the state in which you are okay so the emotion the emotional arousal that you experience at that time later on when you are about to uh, know you are told to recollect your emotional arousal also uh, know plays an important role okay experience the emotional experience at that time and emotional experience at this point in time Okay, how charged you were there at that point in time and how uh, know, charged you are at this point in time. If these two overlaps, okay, it will work as a fantastic retrieval queue. Okay. So, what we have discussed? Event specific, time specific. So, event at a given time okay, recollected as one segment forms the episodic memory. Okay. We have seen good number of examples of episodic memory. The time of practice the space between two events that takes place, how much of processing, how uh, we uh, try to uh, store the information, the file name that we try to give and of course, the state and the context in which the event happened and in which the recollection is uh, being made. So, these are the prominent factors that affects episodic memory.